Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of HRS 183, which condemns anti-Semitism unambiguously, as well as anti-Muslim bigotry and all forms of prejudice against minorities, as contrary to fundamental American values and principles. This resolution makes clear that we condemn anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and racism no matter where on the political spectrum they may emanate from, right, left, or center. This resolution is a statement of our values as a nation. And while it focuses on concerns raised in the last few weeks regarding anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, it addresses those noxious forms of bigotry in the context of our broader concern with all forms of bigotry and hatred in our country. Bigotry against members of minority groups based on their actual or perceived religion, ethnicity, race, or national origin are among the cardinal sins of our nation. As the resolution notes, tolerance and religious freedom are among our country's fundamental principles, so much so that they are enshrined in the very first amendment to the Constitution. Sadly, without constant vigilance, our nation has seen darker moments where religious and other forms of hate have reared their ugly heads. Often, our nation has fallen short of its ideals when they have succumbed to the demagoguery of bigots. Indeed, one of the biggest problems facing our country today, and one that has bedeviled it in the past, is the fact that white supremacists have weaponized bigotry and hatred to achieve political gains. They do so by stoking hatred and division among Americans based on religion, race, ethnicity, or other characteristics. To combat this, it is imperative that all of us, but especially those of us in public life, speak out against such hate. Unfortunately, sometimes the perpetrators of religious and other forms of bigotry are themselves public figures, and even distressingly members of this House. Indeed, in the last few weeks, comments have been made by some of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that can be fairly characterized as anti-Semitic, and I have condemned these remarks. Anti-Semitism is among the most ancient of prejudices and is associated with pernicious stereotypes, including the claim that Jews exert control over the government and the political and the global political and financial systems, that they are obsessed with money and that their loyalty to their home countries is somehow in question. The assertion of these beliefs does not constitute merely making statements of political or policy positions. Rather, propagation of these beliefs have throughout history resulted in harassment, discrimination, violence, and murder against Jews. And while anti-Semitism is an ancient prejudice, its effects are not ancient history. Less than six months ago, a gunman murdered 11 worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, reportedly stating that he quote, wanted all Jews to die, unquote. And nearly two years ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, white supremacists with torches chanted, Jews will not replace us. Despite this ugly history, members on both sides have questioned the loyalty and patriotism of members of this House. The trope that, Isra that support for Israel, particularly among Jewish Americans, is the result of a dual loyalty to Israel and the United States is deeply offensive to me. What I find equally despicable is a somewhat analogous dual loyalty trope increasingly deployed against Muslim Americans. This includes the recent implication by one of our colleagues that another colleague is a spy, and a state Republican Party poster in the West Virginia State Capitol that implied an association between that same colleague and the September 11, 2001 attacks in New York. Indeed, statements have repeatedly been made in the recent past by public officials, including the President, which can fairly be characterized as anti-Muslim more generally. Particularly since the September 11th attacks, Muslim Americans have faced a gauntlet of prejudice, alleging that they are inherently violent, disloyal, and foreign. And this has led to hate-motivated violence. In 2017, for example, at least five mosques were bombed or burned in various cities around the country. Efforts to question the loyalty or patriotism of anyone in this country based on their religion or on any innate characteristic is completely out of bounds. It is my fervent hope that this resolution will be a chance for us, both as an institution and also as a nation, to remind ourselves of what we, of what we all believe in and come together and heal. I urge my colleagues to join me in voting for this resolution today, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York. What? What happened to He reserved. Oh, how much time to ask him? The gentleman from New York is recognized. The gentleman Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now, I now yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin.
Mr. Raskin from Maryland is recognized Mr. for three Speaker, minutes. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. At Sunday school, Jewish kids learn the imperishable words of Hillel, who said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am for myself only, then who am I? And if not now, when? Today, we must all stand strongly and proudly for ourselves in our communities, but we must also stand in strong solidarity with other people in their communities. And we must act now because in America and in nations all over the world, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim bigotry, and other forms of racism and intolerance are sharply on the rise. These old and lethal poisons are not only a threat to individual Jews and Muslims and African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans and Native Americans walking down the street and to our children playing at school. They are the common enemy of liberal democracy, which depends upon tolerance and pluralism to survive. As the world's oldest liberal democracy in a thriving multiracial and multicultural society, America must reject the myths and stereotypes and libels and tropes that make up these ancient hatreds. Anti-Semitism and racism are the gateway to destruction for everything that we believe in as a society. They are a threat to the values of our constitutional creed, pluralism, intolerance, religious freedom, and freedom of association, equal protection for all citizens. Let us stand up today for our most hard-won American ideals, and let us vote for this resolution condemning racism and anti-Muslim bigotry and other forms of racism and intolerance. I yield back to the gentleman from New York. Does the gentleman from New York reserve? I reserve. The gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know where to begin. I really don't. As members of Congress, duly elected by constituencies to serve in this body, who come here with the, the hope and the thought that we exchange ideas and come to this body to actually participate, and for the second time in eight weeks, I am here with my friend from New York debating a resolution that all of us should have learned in kindergarten. Be nice. Don't hate. This resolution doesn't need to be seven pages. It's just wordy. I agree with it. We don't need to hate. It don't matter where it comes from. But it's just what bothers me the most, Mr. Speaker, is what I'm finding right here. Just the other day in this floor, we celebrated the institution of this body with the uh, dean of the house. And we spoke of, of Mr. Dingell, we spoke of uh, Don Young, and we spoke about this institution of this house. What is becoming more and more concerning for me about this process and what breaks my heart as much as anti-Semitic -anti thought, anti-Muslim thought, anti-anybody -anti thought, is that we have broken down in this house. Last week we brought to the floor in which they must, a bill in which was supposed to be about firearms, which the, my friends across the aisle mistakenly didn't understand the penalty associated with the bill. Today, yesterday, I was just on the floor of this house talking about a bill that really, because they rushed it through committee, came to the floor of this house in which if you keep a four-year-old from voting, you're a criminal. This is what happens when we rush. And this week, the entire week, almost, has been taken up by sentiments of a member that were anti-Semitic. Repeating, as Rahm Emanuel said, some of the ugliest stereotypes that we've had. But goes back to, again, my concern here. At 3.20 this afternoon, I was handed or at least was printed, one of the resolutions. I have three more of this resolution than it's taken all week. How long does it take to figure out just don't hate? How many times, how many, how many you know, pages does it take to cite ill and evil? Evil is evil. My heart breaks, Mr. Speaker. 
my heart breaks for this institution. When we say that it's something, we see something that is anti-Semitic, but we say, well, they may not have known it was. It's anti-Semitic. It's anti-Muslim. It's whatever you want to call it. It's just wrong. My heart breaks. And then I find out that we've changed it now lately is to add other groups in here who undoubtedly saw they wasn't a part of the groups. So we added in new groups to the list. I guess since we're at it, why didn't we add Mormons? Why didn't we add Jehovah's Witnesses? They've been attacked. Mormons have many times been accused of dual allegiance. Ask a former presidential candidate. <laughs> Miss Speaker, I, I wish I could, you and I could engage in a colloquy. You're a good gentleman from North Carolina. Explain this to me. Why it took a whole week to figure out to say, hate is hate. You don't need seven pages. We need people to understand that words have consequences, that being a member of Congress matters. That being a member of Congress says that when you say stuff, we can debate civilly. My friend from New York and Maryland, we disagree on most anything. We could probably disagree about the color of, or how many clouds are in the sky, about policy. But it is not a disagreement that hate is hate. And we shouldn't overlook it and try and lump it with everything else and give moral equivalency. But here we are again. Here we are again. Mr. Speaker, I hope we're not here in another four weeks because the first eight weeks we've been here twice. Please let us get back to being the people that this country needs us to be. With that, I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, uh, listening to the gentleman from uh, Georgia, I think I heard him say that he and uh, his colleagues, colleagues were going to vote for this resolution, and I'm glad to hear that, especially since I noted that uh, after the uh, march in Charlottesville and the murder in Charlottesville, when a censure resolution was brought up, was they refute, the Republicans who were then in control of the House refused to bring it to the floor. So I'm glad that they're eager to vote for, or they're willing to vote for this resolution today. I now yield one minute to the distinguished gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Luria. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm a Jewish American woman who served for 20 years in uniform and continue to serve in the United States Congress. At the age of 17, when I entered the United States Naval Academy, I first took the oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I subsequently repeated that oath six times at every promotion and rank, and most recently when I had the honor to become a member of Congress. Is that not enough to prove my loyalty to our nation? I deployed six times, serving in six ships in the Middle East and Western Pacific, working under challenging conditions while operating complex weapon systems, overseeing nuclear reactors, driving ships, and ultimately commanding a combat-ready unit of 400 sailors. Is that not enough to prove my loyalty to our nation? In the first three years my husband and I were married, we spent almost two years apart so that we could both serve at sea and deploy three times. Is that not enough to prove my loyalty to our nation? Am I look, to look back on my military career and the sacrifices it meant for my family and remain silent in the face of people? Does the gentleman reserve? I, I yield the gentlelady another 30 seconds. The gentlelady is yielded an additional 30 seconds. Thank you. And remain silent in the face of people questioning my loyalty to our country. I believe that I speak clearly for all fellow Jewish, fellow Jewish veterans that this echoes of language that has been used to marginalize and persecute the Jewish people for centuries. The recent accusations of dual loyalty call into question the equal footing of Jewish members in elected office and by extension, all Jews living in America. I'm proud to vote on this resolution in condemnation of this rhetoric. I yield my time. 
The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would uh, remind, I don't think my friend from New York would question my belief that what happened at Charlottesville or anywhere else was bad. I don't think he really meant that, Mr. Speaker, because I do believe it is bad. And I think this, what is bad is having to write this bit thing seven days and having to figure this out. With that, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let's all be honest with each other. Uh, we are here today right now because of anti-Semitic rhetoric from one member of this chamber said again and again and again. We would not be on this floor right now otherwise to discuss this topic. If that member was a Republican, that member's name would be in this resolution, and this resolution would be all about condemning anti-Semitism, and it would be done so forcefully. That member in January had to apologize for talking about a hypnosis of Israel that they have over the entire world. That member had to apologize in February by saying that if you support Israel, it must be because you're bought off by Jews. That member called it an unequivocal apology, even though she filled it with equivocation. And now we're back again, this time by saying that if you support the U.S.-Israel relationship, that you must have pledged allegiance to a foreign government. Except this time, that member is refusing to apologize. Even if you gave that member every benefit of the doubt that she had no idea what she was doing, why now wouldn't she be apologizing? Why would she be more emboldened to refuse an apology altogether? I apparently uh, am giving Rep. Omar more credit than uh, the speaker is because I don't believe she is naive. I believe that she knows exactly what she's doing. It is an American value, by the way, to have reasonable, legitimate criticism of a government, whether it be the U.S. government, Israel, or any other government. It is not an American value, though, to be hurling anti-Semitic rhetoric. Anti-Semitism must be condemned unequivocally and emphatically. We have members of this chamber who associate with Louis Farrakhan who says, quote, Hitler was a very great man. Let's talk about a double standard. In January, we all came to this chamber. We condemned white supremacy. We named a Republican member. We kicked that member off of his committees. He can't serve on the Small Business Committee, but this member will continue to serve on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. But no, now we can't come here and just emphatically, solely, forcefully condemn anti-Semitism and name names, but if it was a Republican, we would. It's time to call out these statements for what they are. Pointed, bigoted, unreasonable, illegitimate, anti-Semitic. I commend my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who have been speaking out about all this anti-Semitism. A few members come to mind. Chairman Engel, Congressman Deutsch, Congressman Nadler, Congresswoman Lowy, Congressman Gottheimer. Many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I believe to their core, know how very wrong this is, and there are many other members to name as well. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say thank you to each and every one of them, because support of Israel, support of Jews, standing against anti-Semitism has been bipartisan in the past. It should be bipartisan today, and should be bipartisan for every moment in the future. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I now yield one and a half minutes to the distinguished whip, uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Clyburn. The gentleman from South Carolina, the majority whip is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding me the time. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this resolution, condemning anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and bigotry against minorities. This resolution expresses our rejection of all attempts to weaponize words and sow discord and division. Make no mistake, our caucus is unified, but unity does not mean unanimity. We are the most diverse caucus in the history of Congress. We are a true reflection of who and what America is. Each of us brings our own familiar backgrounds and personal experiences to this August body. Those experiences help shape our values and our perspectives, and we do so as we do the work of the American people. We learn from one another, and we do so following President Lincoln's declaration, and I quote, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right 
God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. This resolution condemns hateful expressions of intolerance, honors the heritages and experiences of all who serve in this body, and commits all of us to the continued search of a more perfect union. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank uh, the gentleman from New York for his comments. We're here today because a member of this body issued a series of anti-Semitic statements. And I couldn't help but think of what justice means and what mercy means. Well, we want to temper justice with mercy. So the first time we come to understand that maybe the depth of what was said was, was maybe accidental. The second time, maybe less so. And certainly the third time, we now have a pattern. And we begin to wonder how we extend mercy when justice cries out against one who is anti-Semitic. It doesn't help that Democratic leaders have attempted to rationalize and protect this individual, whether it's appearing on the cover of a national magazine, whether it's saying, quote, she did not understand the full weight of the words, close quote, one wonders what more needs to be done to try to eradicate anti-Semitism from this body. Some have said that to specifically condemn these statements and to remove her from her committee assignments would stifle legitimate criticism of Israel. But the problem with that argument is this. The comments made did not, were not directed at Israel, were not directed to to policy were not directed towards the American-Israel relationship. They were instead directed to Americans with the allegation that they have a dual loyalty, which is an ancient anti-Semitic cliche that has been used to target the Jewish community throughout history. How about this in the future? If a member of Congress desires to criticize Israel or criticize American policy towards Israel, maybe they can do so without resorting to an anti-Semitic rhetoric that is inflammatory, unnecessary, and frankly, it's hateful. So we stand here today and we look at a, a, uh, a resolution condemning hatred of any kind. Who can disagree with that? I don't. I don't disagree with that. But what I will say is you cannot temper justice any longer with mercy with rationalization, sooner or later, you have to face what the awful truth is. And if someone is going to persist in making anti-Semitic hateful statements, to bury that is inexcusable without a yield. The gentleman yields Sir. back. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, is recognized. Where is he? Oh. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I now yield the uh, distinguished majority leader, uh, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Mr. Hoyer, one minute. The gentleman from Maryland, the majority leader, is recognized. Let me suggest at the outset that no party be too self-righteous on the issue of supporting prejudice and bigotry uh, too often. This is a very serious matter. It is important to call out anti-Semitism in a way that is unmistakable and unambiguous. We must do so, because whenever some people begin to question the allegiance or patriotism of Americans, indeed, whether certain people fully belong as part of our country, it is critical to set the record straight. 
Recent statements employing time-worn tropes of dual loyalty have deeply and correctly unsettled American Jewish communities because their allegation is, simply put, that American Jews who support Israel are not loyal to this country. I stand as a very strong supporter of Israel and a very loyal American. Such allegations fall into, as has been said, a century-old and dark history of Jews being marginalized and set apart. They recall past evils that occurred in other countries and in our own when, according to the Anti-Defamation League, people accused Jews of, and I quote, being disloyal neighbors or citizens because of their connection to Israel or Jewish communities elsewhere in the world. That was false, and it was bigoted. To be clear, the First Amendment protects the right of every American to criticize policies and leaders, whether in our own country or others. That is the glory of our democracy. However, in these past few weeks, those who say they are only criticizing Israel's leaders or policies have instead been making claims about the allegiance and motivation of Israel's defenders. I do not believe there is anyone in our caucus, not one, who wishes to silence debate over policy. Rather, what is being called for is an end to the invocation of age-old anti-Semitic tropes that demonize people instead of criti criticize policies. Accusation that Jews bear dual allegiance because of support for Israel or concerns for its safety are false, and they are also hurtful. Canards that must be opposed and exposed for what they are. Bigotry. They elicit legitimate fear and uncertainty in the individuals and communities they target. In much the same way, we have also seen vile examples of hatred aimed at painting Muslim Americans as somehow disloyal to our nation or not fully belonging, causing similar feelings of insecurity and distress. No Muslims can come to our country. Those feelings cannot be discounted either. One of our own colleagues was the target of an Islamic phobic attack impugning a member of this house. That ought to be unacceptable to all of us. We have seen this same form of exclusion, hatred in recent years whenever acts of bigotry have been directed against African Americans and when Latino and Latina citizens have been yelled at to go back to their countries. This is their country. This phenomenon is also a reminder of the horrific internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War. None of us ought to be like Pontius Pilate and think that we have not fallen short of the principles enunciated in our declaration. In our multicultural republic, sometimes it is incumbent upon the American people to speak as one nation, indivisible, and make clear affirmation that all Americans have an equal share in our republic, that no one's race or creed or origin can call into question one's love of country. I will continue to urge unity in the face of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, 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 homophobia, transphobia, racism against African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans, and other forms of prejudice and discrimination. American Jews, including those who serve our nation in Congress, need to be reassured that they are equal partners in the diverse coalition for justice, opportunity, tolerance, and equality and that they have true allies who stand with them as firmly as they have stood with others. 
I will continue to make that clear. America is rightfully respected for its Declaration of Independence and its Constitution as amended and perfected, both of which proclaim the dignity and rights of individuals endowed by their Creator. But America has also seen too often the denial of that dignity and equality to millions of its citizens based upon the color of their skin, the land of their birth, or the faith of their forebears. My colleagues, if we are to be better than our past, we must reject all forms of bigotry and prejudice directed at any of our fellow human beings and fellow Americans. Let us all, in solidarity and in union with the principles of our country, support this resolution. And I yield back the balance of my time. Could you tell me how much time Mr. Collins has and how much time I have, please? Thank you. The gentleman from New York has nine minutes remaining. And the gentleman from Georgia has eight and three-quarter minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomer. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, according to Proverbs, something that uh, people who are practicing Jews and Christians believe says there are seven things that are detestable to the Lord. One is haughty eyes, another lying tongue, another hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict within the community. It goes so far as to say these are things the Lord hates. So the word hate is not wrong in the Jewish and Christian tradition, but anything beyond this is wrong. And yes, there have been persecution of Christians, there have been persecution of Muslims, but anybody who has persecuted a people in the name of Christianity was not acting as a Christian. That is not part of the faith. But what makes this so dangerous and the reason I will vote against this resolution is because we came here because of an anti-Semitic remark and we came here to condemn anti-Semitism but this resolution as changed up over the last hour now condemns just about everything and the reason that is so dangerous is that anti-Semitism, hatred for the children of Israel is a very special kind of hatred that should never be watered down. There has never been a persecution of a people like the Jewish people from 1933 to 1945, over six million killed. And it started with little things, hateful remarks made about the children of Israel that grew and grew. And as if it was okay because it was made by somebody who had a grudge, it was let go and it built until it led to the death of six million Jews. And we have to say, no, we will not let it go on. And that's why I'll vote against it. It's water is expired. the sentiment. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York. Mr. Speaker, I now yield one minute to the uh, distinguished gentlelady from California, Ms. Bass. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Congressional Black Caucus condemns all forms of white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia in the strongest terms possible. This could have been an issue that sowed further division among the country, but instead has united everyone around our shared values, condemning all forms of bigotry and hatred. The Black Caucus stands firmly against all expressions of hate and is concerned by the recent uptick in hateful rhetoric and crimes targeting minority communities. For example, a white nationalist murdered nine African-American worshipers at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina on the evening of June 15th 2015 in hopes of igniting a nationwide race war 
or the perpetrator of the deadliest attack on Jewish people in the United States history at the Tree of Life Synagogue building in Pittsburgh that killed 11 worshipers. It is unfortunate that the President of the United States has shown a complete lack of leadership on these issues and has in fact fanned the flames. As chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, the CBC remains committed to building a more perfect union by engaging in constructive dialogue that affirms America as a nation welcoming to all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to go back to what I was talking about when, I, when we first started this and being you know, saddened to be here and also how we're continually rushing stuff to the floor. And I know it's an oversight, but it, it goes, goes back to my very statement here. And again, I could, I'd remind everyone here, if we wanted to write a simple resolution here, hate is hate, it's not good, don't say it, you know, think about what you're doing. You could have done this in a, in a half a paragraph. Not to belittle any of this, this is all wrong. But on page seven, number seven, we have a resolution that says condemns death threats received by Jewish and Muslim members of Congress. I'm a member who has had someone put in jail for threatening to kill me and my daughter. Why don't we condemn that? We forgot it. We forgot it like we had other groups in this bill that we've wrote three times that we had to add because we forgot them. As I mentioned earlier, why didn't we add Mormons? Why didn't we add Jehovah's Witnesses? It's not that the issue here is the hate and what happened and where it went back to. And our speakers on both sides have, have went to the very issue of why we're here. I go back to the issue of what I talked about earlier, that I am saddened for the state of our house, that we are so concerned about trying to make talking points and finishing it, that we rush stuff to this floor. This is not what we do or who we are. Hate is hate. It's bad. It's wrong. Quit saying it. But don't keep rushing stuff to the floor when you don't even really understand what you put in the bill. And with that, I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I now yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman from New York, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Engel. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to vote yes on this measure today. I do have concerns about how we're dealing with these issues, but obviously all forms of hatred and bigotry are intolerable and we should go on the record in saying so. I'm voting for this because when I read the resolution, I agree with everything it says. But let me say this to the criticism that the Democratic majority won't condemn anti-Semitism. A few weeks back, we took the virtually unprecedented step of accepting a Republican motion to recommit, the procedural tool the majority never supports because it condemned anti-Semitism. We were proud to set aside precedent to condemn anti-Semitism then, and in today's resolution, we're doing so again today. So contrary to what some are saying, that's twice in the course of a month that the Democratic majority is condemning anti-Semitism on the floor of the House. But I must say, the words spoken by our colleague from Minnesota last week touched a very real, very raw place for me. And my desire for the House to go on record again specifically condemning anti-Semitism wasn't a desire to single the gentlewoman out or to stifle debate on U.S. policy towards Israel. But it was a desire and need to say that certain words, no matter who utters them, have no place in our public discourse and indeed can be very dangerous. And when a member of our body speaks the way it speaks, the, the way the, the representative from Minnesota spoke, then we need to single it out and say we will not tolerate it. But in the last week, these problems have been compounded. Since the comments that sparked this controversy, the gentlewoman from Minnesota has become the target of vile, racist, Islamophobic smears and threats. One begets another, and we've got to put a stop to it now. That's horrific. Islamophobia has no place in this body or anywhere in the United States, and anti-Semitism certainly doesn't either. I wish we had had a separate resolution about anti-Semitism. I think we deserved it. I think it was wrong not to have it. I don't think we should mix everything. But I want to say very clearly and very loudly that anti-Semitism will never be tolerated by me, never be tolerated by this body, and no member of Congress should be making anti-Semitic statements. No member of Congress should be saying hurtful things and then not apologizing for them. So I hope we can put everything together, support this resolution. It condemns all kinds of hatred, whether it's Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, any kind of hatred, that's what we need to do. And every time that anti-Semitism rears its ugly head, we need to stop it. 
and this resolution is a fine resolution, and I will support it, but I am very disappointed that we weren't able to have a separate resolution to specifically condemn anti-Semitism and what our colleague said that really was, was a very hateful term. I hope we can put everything together in this House. I know we can. I know people on both sides of the aisle want to work together. We want to stomp out any form of hatred, particularly anti-Semitism. I will continue to work with anybody who wants to do that, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Do you continue to reserve? The gentleman from New York. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that was, and I appreciate uh, my colleague from New York's statements just then. It's, it's, it's frankly a shame that he had to come say that in this context. It was, but I appreciate what he said because he's right on. He's, he's correct. And with that, I yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank the gentleman for yielding, and I fully associate myself with the comments from the gentleman from New York condemning anti-Semitism, full stop entirely appropriate thing to do. I just think it's curious how we ended up here. I mean, we are having this debate right now because Democrats had an objection to something said by a Democrat. And so they launch off on this drafting project. And then lo and behold, I hear all the remarks on the floor and a lot of the substance in the resolution is about President Trump and criticizing him and trying to open wounds. And so this is unfortunately becoming the new mantra of the left in the Congress. When they've got a problem that they can't solve, it must be President Trump's fault. It's a lot of the sentiment that we see echoed out of the Judiciary Committee where there is no Russian collusion, the Mueller report is about to drop. Democrats know it is not going to allege Russian collusion, and so they have to launch an 81-pronged investigation to harass our president. They can't get their own house in order, so everything's got to be the fault of a president who is creating more economic opportunity, reducing unemployment, ending wars, and doing a heck of a job for the country. I thank the gentleman for Georgia, and I yield back. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. The gentleman from New York is recognized. I'll reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Georgia. I'll reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York. Mr. Speaker, I now yield uh, 45 seconds to the distinguished gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a Jewish member of Congress who lost family in the Holocaust and whose grandfather fought the Nazis, I need no reminder about our responsibility to confront bigotry, hatred, and intolerance wherever it is found. No matter how hard one tries, the allegation of dual loyalty simply does not constitute a legitimate opinion about foreign policy. It's a slur against Jews, it's indefensible, and it's deserving of the condemnation by everyone, every time. More than anything, it's offensive to question my loyalty or anyone's loyalty to the United States of America here, simply because I'm Jewish. The same way it was appalling to question President John Kennedy's loyalty to the United States because he was Catholic. I'm glad the Congress is voicing its opposition to anti-Semitism and made it clear that dual loyalty smear is unacceptable. Unfortunately, it was also clear from the discussions this week and the ultimate resolution that treating anti-Semitism anti is being treated differently Gentlemen's than other forms of expired. bigotry and hatred. There shouldn't be an asterisk next to anti-Semitism, and I'll continue to fight Gentlemen's it. Time has expired. Thank you. How much time do I have, uh, Mr. Collins? Have the gentleman from New York has four and one quarter minutes. Do I have? The gentleman from Georgia has four minutes remaining. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Mr. Speaker, I now yield. I now yield 45 seconds to the distinguished gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Gentlelady from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One thing we are all reminded of this week is that words have power and divisive words cause pain. Every Jewish person in America, no matter where they are from, could share a story of deeply painful anti-Semitism that they have personally experienced. For me, at its worst, Nazi-obsessed internet trolls mercilessly taunted my children with Holocaust threats too vile for me to describe on this floor. 
And this pain is frequently felt by all too many Americans. How you look or speak, who you love, or where you live and pray can still invite unwanted and potentially dangerous words of hostility. The conversation today about anti-Semitism, allegiance, and loyalty is necessary because remaining silent against hatred and bigotry is not an option. I'm a second-generation American on both sides of my family. Two generations later, it was possible for me to become a member of the U.S. Congress, only in America. So questioning my allegiance is painful and personal. Unfortunately, this dual loyalty question is not isolated to Jews. Words have power. We must carefully General choose Lady's our words and expired. make sure that we use them to unite us and not to divide us. I yield back. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York. Mr. Speaker, I now yield one minute to the distinguished Speaker of the House. The gentlelady from California, the Speaker of the House, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank him for bringing this important resolution to the floor of the House. Uh, I commend uh, the, co the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, and the gentleman from Louisiana, the very distinguished gentleman from, uh, uh, for his uh, participation in writing uh, uh, this important resolution. It is uh, in the spirit of unity and solidarity with my colleagues as we come together in this chamber of our American democracy to condemn all forms of hatred, racism, prejudice, and discrimination with a hopefully single and strong voice. It is profoundly disturbing reality that anti-Semitism is on the rise in America today, and anti-Semitic uh, attacks increasingly are at the highest rate on record. Uh, appalling acts of hatred and bigotry are being inflicted on, our, uh, on all uh, elements of our society, be they African American, Latino, uh, people from Asia, uh, uh, attacks in terms of people being Muslim or other religious faiths. This isn't who we are as a country. We all believe that there is a, uh, that there is a, a spark of divinity in every person who exists, that we are all God's children, and that we come to uh, meet with each other in a way that commands respect for that provenance of, of our being all God's children. And then we see people making attacks on each other throughout the country, whether it's in Charlottesville or whether it's anti-immigrant uh, attitudes uh, that have reared their ugly heads uh, in our country. And it is uh, uh, in that spirit that I come to the floor almost emotionally uh, to speak about this. In the Congress and across the country, we must accept um, uh, debate on any subject in a legitimate way, whether it's on our U.S.-Israel policies and the rest. Uh, that is protected by the value of free speech and democratic debate in the United States and in Israel. Israel is our friend uh, and our friend in that region. Our uh, we support Israel out of friendship, out of shared values, but also because it is in our national interest to do so. But not every one of us in this body uh, agrees on every provision of our, uh, or any consideration in that relationship. That's a separate and complete issue from anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, whether it's in tax, form of attacks on Jewish people, anti-Semitic tropes, prejudicial accusations, or any other form of hatred is deeply and unequivocally offensive and must be condemned wherever it is heard. And all of us must remember, as members of Congress, as President of the United States, that our words are weightier once we cross the threshold into Congress, and indeed they weigh a ton when someone becomes the President of the United States. It's also disturbing that Islamophobia and white supremacism remain a sinister and shameful presence in America today. Too often that goes under-noticed or unchecked. Such attacks are even targeted 
have targeted some of us in this body. We must condemn these attacks and confront them. As members of Congress and Americans, we have a solemn, urgent responsibility fund to fight to end the scourge of bigotry, racism, and hatred in our country. I do want to again salute our colleagues, Cedric Richmond, our distinguished former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and now a distinguished uh, leader in the WHIPS operation uh, for his uh, leadership in shaping this legislation. And again, Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland for his, his uh, leadership role in all of this. I salute all of our members for demonstrating the courage to have this difficult conversation and for doing so in a spirit of great respect, disagreeing sometimes, but never questioning the patriotism or motivation of anyone with whom we serve. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman Nadler, for the important work as chairman of the Judiciary Committee that you have done uh, to give us this moment, this important moment on the floor of the House. But that, I ask, you know, I hope that we will have a unanimous vote in support of this resolution and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman Mr. Speaker, from New York. We're prepared to close. Is the gentleman. Uh... Who's last? I'll close. Okay, gentleman, from, gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, before I yield in just a second, I, I do, again, I want to go back to something. I appreciate the words that have been said here. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. It took seven pages to describe what it simply can be said is don't hate. Watch what you say. You're a member of Congress. We deserve better. The House deserves better. When we understand this, then we can begin to understand also, I want to go back to something that I will hit again. It goes back to this is, again, something put together because we couldn't come to agreement on the very nature of what started this, which was anti-Semitic comments, and to having to have some of our Jewish legislators come down here and condemn that is, is sad, wanting to have to vote for something that at the very heart tore them apart and you could hear it in their voice. But yet, they have to vote for this. We also put it together, getting at 3.20 this afternoon, having to get this. We left out the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We left out Wiccans. We left out Jehovah's Witnesses. We left out disabled people who are often discriminated and had hateful things about. We also, in the thing, found out that the only ones that we're going to condemn getting death threats are Jewish members and Muslim members. We're not condemning anything else. This is just another attempt to rush to do something to fix something, as I said last week, and I'll say it again, what makes you feel good doesn't always heal you. This is another example of a rush product. With that, I yield the remainder of our time to a, one minute, I yield one minute to the gentleman from California. The gentleman the from California, leader. the minority leader, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to start by thanking a member from the other side of the aisle, Chairman Elliot Engel. Thank you for when you heard the language that you stood up. Thank you for your work. To all the members that are here, this shouldn't be this hard. We should not have to go through the number of versions that we had to do. We shouldn't have to be on this floor even speaking about this. I hope we won't be back. Of all the things that have happened this Congress, this is what we've talked about the most. This is the action that this Congress has taken the most, twice. Twice we have to make a statement that we're opposed to anti-Semitism. The first time, it took the minority that doesn't have very many abilities to bring something to the floor, but we did and we spoke with one voice. But now we're back in a few weeks stating the same thing, but without apologies. Without apologies from that voice. It did not have to be this hard. We didn't have to break 72-hour rule that you put in this year to make it less than an hour, because fear of what would happen tomorrow on a motion to recommit. I will pledge to you this. 
from this side of the aisle. And I hope you understand this clearly. Any hatred, we take action. I hope you've seen from the action on this side of the aisle of where we stand. We didn't have to have a resolution, but when it came to the floor, we voted for it. We took action before it came to the floor, and it wasn't simply, please apologize. It didn't have to be this hard. Yes, Mr. Speaker, our Madam Speaker was right. America is better than this. But to my members, Congress is better than this. Please do not make history right about our time with these two years that the most we've ever done is that we had to keep bringing resolutions to the floor to tell people that anti-Semitism is wrong. If that's the only action we're going to take, I know we're better than this. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman Reserve. from Georgia has Reserve. one and one half minutes remaining. And I'm reserving. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from, New so the gentleman from Georgia. So close. Yes. Joking. Mr. Speaker, as we come to the conclusion of our second time doing this, I'll echo the sentiments of our leader who just spoke. I echo the sentiments of most everyone who has spoke here that this is wrong. You know, one time we should learn. Two times we're getting nothing out of this anymore because undoubtedly we're getting numb to it because we just put everything it can imaginable that we could think of in the short amount of time unless somebody brought it up into a resolution to say, this is hate, we don't need to do this. We don't need a manual to tell us who we can't hate. How is this so hard? Why do we blow process? Why do we disrespect this institution? By bringing together things that are thrown together at the last minute, that leave out death threats to any other member besides two groups of members, that leave out others who have been hated upon. It breaks my heart after just a day or so ago speaking of the institutional spirit and hearing the dean of this house talk about working together. It breaks my heart that we're eight, nine weeks into this session and this is our largest accomplishment, telling the world, don't hate. That's our largest accomplishment. Mr. Speaker, my fear is with this today, I just, I, I don't want to be here again. But with the way this was handled, I fear we may be. We're better than this. This not, should not be where we're at. Why do we keep coming back? Because many time members forget the awesome responsibility that they have been given as members of Congress. Our mouths and our tongue can be our greatest enemy. Let us remember that as we seek guidance each day. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I now yield the uh, balance of our time to the distinguished gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Mr. Richmond. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond, is recognized. Thank the gentleman for New York for yielding. Let me just say that we are better than this. And we've seen in this body where we've had members attacked. And we came together right here in this body where we all held hands and we said that words have consequences and we were going to do better. We were going to set an example. And before we could walk off the floor, there was a commercial running to attack the character of our then leader, Nancy Pelosi. So hollow words mean nothing to me. Booker T. Washington once said that we are as separate as the fingers, but we are as whole as the hand. So we come together today, hopefully as whole as the hand, to condemn anti-Semitism, bigotry, racism, all of the phobias, Islamophobia, homophobia. What we do is push love, like Dr. King said. But in the eulogy for Dr. King, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays blamed in part the American people for the assassination. He pointed out that the assassin heard enough condemnation of Dr. King and of Negroes to feel that he had public support. So when Dylan Roof murdered nine worshipers in Charleston, he thought he had public support. 
The shooter at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh thought he had public support. The neo-Nazis and the white nationalists who marched in Charlottesville thought they had public support. The shooter of Gabby Giffords thought he had public support. The shooter of Steve Scalise thought he had public support. What we're doing here today is making it unequivocally clear to the public that no one has the support to engage in discrimination and racism and anti-Semitism. But Dr. Mays went on to challenge us as Americans to do better. He said, we, and not the assassin, represent America at its best. He said, we have the power, not the prejudice, not the bigoted, not the anti-Semite, not the assassin, to make things better. So we, too, in Congress have the power and the obligation to make things right. Though we come from dramatically diverse backgrounds, and though we have lived very different lives, we must all right now stand together against bigotry. We must make clear to those who traffic in all forms of hatred, neo-Nazis, white nationalists, racists of all kinds, anti-Semites, Islamophobes, homophobes, transphobes, and those who demonize and demean immigrants from Latin America and throughout the world, that they have no place in public disclosure. And for the record, we've had, this will be our third vote on anti-Semitic measures. We voted against both of them. You all voted for one and then voted against the next one. The House has been debating a campaign finance voting